again, everyone, and we are ready to begin our Discovering God Hour. Uh, if you haven't been here in a little while for Discovering God Hour, we have been uh, kind of going over the sermon again. Uh, it's a time for us to, you know, when you're listening to Pastor Bo preach, uh, probably some questions might pop into your hand, uh, into your hands. Um, <clears throat> uh, what is that? <laughs> a question <laughs> pop into your mind. Question might pop into your mind, and uh, it's not really the appropriate time at that moment. I don't know. Bo might feel otherwise, but I don't think you want to raise your hand in the middle of a sermon with questions, probably. Um, but now is the time for you to, an- to ask any questions that you might have. Uh, also, this is a time for if something stuck out to you as particularly meaningful or um, challenging or something that you felt like was just really encouraging uh, about the message, then now is the time uh, to bring those things up as well. And they can be an encouragement to your brothers and sisters uh, who are here who, who may not have even thought about that. But you bring it up and now it's like, oh yeah, that is good. That's great, right? So we'll try and uh, bring some application into this as well. Uh, as as uh, some of the, the things that just meant a lot to us. Okay, so let's begin with prayer, um, and then we'll get started. Are there any requests that I can pray for this morning? Any prayer requests about this week? If not, I can pray a great general prayer. Okay, pray for Ruth. No, we... Billy, no, no, you're here, you're fine. We're not going to pray for Billy. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) We'll pray for that whole row over there. Matter of fact, now that I look at it, the whole section, we'll just pray for all of them. All right? All right, let's go ahead and pray if there's nothing specific. All right, let's go. Father in heaven, thank you so much for uh, the chance that we can have today to just continue to focus our attention on um, these last few plagues uh, in Exodus. Uh, We thank you that you did raise up Pharaoh to show your power, not his. Uh, It was ironic and tragic for him, but for us, it is uh, the story of how uh, the world works. Satan exalted himself against you, and you put him down on the ground and told him on on your belly you will crawl all the days of your life until he is finally defeated someday. And so, God, we see parallels between him and Pharaoh, and our hearts are are encouraged that um, although it really feels like we're living in Egypt um, at times, we're in a culture that does not uh, listen to your word, does not submit to your word, um, but we know that one day Jesus Christ will return and he will return. destroyed his enemies just like you did back in Exodus and and he will bring us into the promised land the new heavens and the new earth and so we look forward to that day and we pray that you would come quickly Lord Jesus we also do think of the members of our body that cannot uh, meet with us regularly in person who uh, faithfully watch online and we pray that you would watch over them and that you would give their bodies strength and health health. We pray for even the members who are here that you would keep us safe and keep our bodies strong and our minds sharp that we might come and worship you together uh, each Sunday. Lord, we thank you again for this time and we pray that your spirit would help us and lead us into the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so um, we learned several things about God from these uh, terrible plagues that fell on Egypt. Uh, Number one, we learn that God is a God who speaks. He speaks, and when he speaks, we had better listen. He's a God who speaks, and when he speaks, we had better listen. Number two, the second main point was he is the God who uh, who resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And then number three, he is a God of unmatched power. All right, so let's take these three main points, and uh, I'll ask you at this point to respond 
uh, with anything that you felt was particularly meaningful or any questions you had about any of these main points. Let's start with God is a God who speaks and we ought to listen. All right. Does anyone have anything in that section that stuck out to you as particularly meaningful? Yes, sir. Well, it is. That's an interesting question, and I have read a little bit about that. <clears throat> and it seems like these are not these are slaves in the sense of household servants, like Egyptians had household servants. the The Israelites were slaves on a national level. It seems like they were the slave labor force, but it also seems like Egyptians had their own personal slaves. Um, you know, Israelites were out there building the pyramids and building the storehouses for Egypt. But then, you know, the average Egyptian might have four or five slaves of his own. Some of them watch over the cattle. Some of them watch over the crops. Others clean the house and do those sorts of things. So you might have more insight on that. But I don't think it's right to say that the Egyptians stayed inside and left the Israelites out to die. I don't think that's what's going on. Anyway, it's, it's, a lot of people speculate that at this point, all of the, the work that Israel is doing has ceased. Hmm. And if you read chapters around the plague, there's no mention of Israel going to work or working at the same period of time. It's almost as if Egypt is sort of inside <coughs> Yeah, probably not forever, but this is a time of national crisis for for Egypt. I mean, all these plagues are basically bringing the whole nation to a grinding halt, um, agriculturally and economically, which I think might be part of the reason, and Bo, you can correct me if, it, if I'm wrong here, but I think this might be why... Um, Pharaoh for the first time is like, okay, hold up, I made a mistake, because the the economics of Egypt are starting to really be affected. The uh, you know the the first few are are terrible. I mean, water turned to blood. You got to find water to drink beside the river. You've got frogs all over the place. You've got gnats all over the place. You got flies all over the place. But then the livestock begin to die, and then the hail comes and crushes all the crops, and we're talking about their food supply. You know, we, we know how it felt, right, during COVID to go to the grocery store, and there were no, no bread, um, you couldn't find bread or water or, you know, baby formula or whatever, and I mean, at this point, all of the Egyptians are probably looking at Pharaoh like, what are we doing here? Why are you? And he's kind of going, okay, I made a mistake. You guys can go. So then you got the plague, you got the hail, and then you've got the locusts, which do a tremendous amount of damage as well. Yes, Tom. Before the hail started? Before it got started, but I'm not how much more do you expect the Egyptians to have the most damage caused by this? Yeah, that's a good um, question. I think there you go. Yeah, I was looking for that time reference. Where where is it? Verse eighteen, yeah. Yeah, it's right in the middle. Behold, about this time tomorrow I will cause very heavy hail to fall. So, yeah, there is some question about, you know, the plagues in general, like how long, how much time elapsed between plague one and two, 
two and three, you know, um, crops are growing a little bit and then being destroyed and then other crops are growing and being destroyed. And so it's not clear, but, but in this case, he does come in and, um, he, uh, yeah, he says tomorrow. One thing that I found was interesting, um, in verse 27, okay, the hail is falling, it struck down everything, verse 25, that grew in the field, man and beast, hail struck down every plant of the field, broke every tree of the field, only in the land of Goshen there was no hail. Verse 27, Pharaoh sent and called Moses and Aaron and said to them, this time I have sinned, the Lord is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Plead with me, um, for there has been enough of God's thunder and hail. I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. And Moses said to him, As soon as I have gone out of the city, I will stretch my hands to the Lord, and the thunder will cease, and there will be no more hail, so that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. Okay? Now, it's interesting to me, and I don't know, this is just, this is my imagination, so maybe it's not exactly like this, but the hail is still falling. Huge hail, like tree-crushing hail is falling, and Moses is in with Pharaoh, and he goes, I'm going to walk out of this palace, and I'm going to walk to the gates of the city, and as soon as I leave the gates, then I'll raise my hand, and the hail is going to stop. I'm like, why wouldn't you do it when you're indoors? <laughs> so I always tell my students, you know, here's Moses just walking, and hail is going all over, all around him, just smashing into the ground, and he has no fear of anything. He's like, I'm the Lord's chosen. I'm going to walk right out there. Nothing's going to happen to me. As soon as I get out of the city, hail's falling all around me. I lift my hands, and then whoop, it's gone. So I think that that's kind of a pretty like crazy image. I always thought, stop it before you go outdoors, but but maybe that's part of the, you know, I don't know. Maybe that's all in my mind. Yes. Ooh, that is a good question. I can't. Some of you are like, some of you are like, I've had 14. <laughs> All right. Um, I was trying to look. I don't, I don't think it says anywhere um, like the burning bush when God is saying, he says, I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, they will let you go. It doesn't seem to indicate, but I might be missing something. Good question, Tom. I never thought about that one. Oh, who was it? Jewel. Jewel. Great question. All right, I saw other hands go up, I thought, and then they're back down. But God, God speaks, <clears throat> and when he speaks, it's our job to listen. So how can we take that truth that our God is a God who speaks and we must listen to his voice how can we take that and apply that to our situation here in um, Pasco County? Josh. All right. Yeah, I love that. So how can you go a little bit further with that? Like, what are you thinking? Well, so you keep the... Mm -hmm. All 
All right. I love it. So there is a disposition that gives us an opportunity to hear more than just with our ears. It's a, a humility, like he said. It's a patience, like he said. Uh, what else? I want to kind of stick with that because I really like it. Um, besides our disposition, what are some other things that, that we can do to prepare ourselves to hear the voice of the Lord? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, he is speaking to us through his word, but we don't oftentimes take the time to study it. Yeah, so God speaks through his word today. Uh, back in Exodus, he spoke to Pharaoh through Moses the prophet. <clears throat> today, <clears throat> according to, uh, what is it, First Peter and things that, oh no, Hebrews, long ago at many times in his various ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophet, but now he's spoken to us by his son, whom he made heir of all things. Uh, we read in Peter about how um, we have a more sure word of prophecy in the scriptures. So God doesn't speak to us today through prophetic visions and dreams and words from prophets. Today he speaks to us through his word. So part of hearing the voice of God means I'm in the right frame of mind, humble and patiently waiting for him to speak. It also means I'm opening up my Bible and taking some time to, I like what uh, Debbie said, prayerfully read through the scriptures, asking God to speak. What are some other things we can do to make sure we're ready to hear the voice of God, that we're ready to hear it? Yes, Billy. Quiet. Thank you. That's the, that was one I was definitely thinking of. What are some things that break the silence and that they, they, they distract us? from having that silence to, yeah, we all heard. <laughs> Children. <laughs> Children are such a gift. <clears throat> um, but yeah, how much harder is it uh, when you've got uh, kids running around to get some time to uh, sit and read, right? Um, what else causes distractions in our lives that break the silence where we could hear the voice of God? Yes. Ooh. Oh, yes. Uh, whether you understand it or not, Disney has influenced each one of us, um, and their big, I tell my students this all the time, their big message is follow your heart, follow your heart, you know, it doesn't matter what mom and dad say, they're always wrong, but if you follow your heart, you can be the prince or princess, I mean, uh, you know, and uh, so, so yeah, your, your heart is talking to you. And um, oftentimes that's the loudest voice that you hear is when your, your heart says like, no, I've got this under control. I'll tell you where to go. And so we listen to our heart instead of listening to the word of God. Um, <clears throat> no one wants to say this one, so I'm going to say it. But entertainment, you know, television, movies, music, um, uh, I don't like, well, I kind of do. I, I always, 
I always tell people, like, I would love to just have complete silence in my life. No headphones, no television, no noise, just silence. But a lot of people, my, my students, the younger crowd, they, as soon as there's a moment silence, they put in their headphones and they crank up their music. As soon as they get home, they can't stand a silent house. How many of you put the TV on just to have noise in your house? All right? I, we do that sometimes. We turn the TV on just so that there's some noise because there's something about silence that, like, when the darkness falls, silence can be just as deafening, too. So you want to have something in the back. Cell phones are a big distraction for some people, yeah. That's nah, just the young kids. <laughs> yeah. All right, moving right along. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, there is a ton of electronic distraction, and uh, I find myself, I have my Bible app, you know, and so <clears throat> in the morning, I don't like to turn on any lights. I like silence, and I like darkness, okay? Um, <clears throat> and so I'll pull out my phone on the lowest brightness and read my Bible in the dark in the mornings, um, but then I've got my email there, and I've got social media there, too, and all this sort of thing. There is a ton of distraction. So, yeah, putting yourself in the right frame of mind, getting yourself under the teaching of the Word, removing distractions in your life, that will put us in a good position to actually listen to the God who, who is speaking to us. Uh, on a regular basis. I think also uh, included in this, and I don't want to take too much time, but uh, he said God is a God who speaks, and when he says things, we must listen. Um, the Israelites learned the hard way that if God is speaking and you say, I don't want to hear it, 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 then he's going to stop speaking at some point. That's what happened during the, you know, if, if you know that the intertestamental period, if you go to the book of Malachi, which is the last book in the Old Testament, you flip like one blank page and then there's Matthew. That represents 400 years of silence where God said, you don't want to listen to me? Fine. I'm done talking to you for a while. And he left them on their own. Ha <laughs> ha. <clears throat> yeah, you don't want to listen? Fine. I won't say anything. And uh, that, that seems to, uh, you know, be true in our own lives. God, God expects us, when I speak, you listen and you submit and you obey is the point. Not just being hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Yes, my love. Yeah. Yes. Good. Good. Allusion there to Samuel, when uh, you know Samuel is speaking. I mean, uh, God is speaking to Samuel there in his bed, and it says, "Now the word of Yahweh was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision, which is why Samuel and Eli assumes." That, you know, I don't know, something weird's going on. I don't know. Why do you keep asking me who's talking to you, you know? And then finally it dawns on Eli. Oh, my word. I think maybe this is God speaking again. Yeah, absolutely right. You got the period of the judges where everyone is doing what's right in his own eyes. And God says, I'm done for a while. I'm not going to say anything. And then we have Samuel who becomes his next big prophet. All right. Do you want to say something? Yeah, the first, when, when God spoke to Moses of the burning bush, his first appointment was with Israel's elders, the leaders of the nation of Israel. And he went to them and said, God has sent me to deliver you. And um, 
he's going to show his signs and wonders. And they all got excited until Pharaoh took away the straw. And now you got to pick your own stubble and make your bricks and all this. And then they got really depressed. And then I'm sure once the plague started rolling in, especially once they started affecting only the Egyptians and the people in Goshen were fine, I think they probably became more and more aware that this is God is getting us out of here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, the Israelites probably didn't all live in Goshen. They probably were scattered around the area, but you're right. It does seem like they're kind of all huddled together there, maybe, um, at least those who believed. And not all the Jews believed. I mean, there were some who didn't put the blood on the door, I'm sure. There were some Egyptians who did put the blood on the door because they believed. So it goes back to, you know, within national Israel, there is the Israel of God, the faithful, the, belie- the believers um, that, that follow him. So not just because you're, you were an Israelite doesn't necessarily mean you were protected from the death of the firstborn. It was faith that caused you to paint your door, um, which is what it's always been about with the people of God. All right, uh, let's move on to the second uh, point, the second main point that, that Bo had. He's the God who resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. All right? You got it. He's good. Uh, any, any thoughts or questions on this uh, section? We're in uh, chapter 10 at this point. The plague of the locusts. Yes, Debbie. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yep. So the the locust plague, I don't if you've never if you've never seen it, there's that uh Planet Earth series and in one of the videos on that Planet Earth series, they show you a locust plague where swarms of hundreds of thousands of locusts, a bunch of swarms will converge, and there will be just millions, hundreds of millions of locusts. And it's the sky goes dark, and the sound is deafening, and they're crawling all over the ground, and they're flying in the air, and it's this unbelievable nightmare. Um, but yeah, I did the math while he was uh, speaking, and so he said it was 25 by 37 miles, which is 925 square miles, and in his illustration, it was one-third of a square mile, so we multiply that by three, and then how many, uh, 35,000 people, yeah, that's what I thought, that's what I did, so uh, times 35 
1,000 equals 90. It, they're eating the equivalent of 97 million people. 97, 125,000 million people. And is that in a day or what, what was the time period? A day. Yeah, so, I mean, that's going to, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there, uh, you, watch that video. You can just YouTube it. Um, just YouTube locust plague, and it'll talk about how much they eat. Uh, as they go, they can just completely wipe out all the food uh, in an in an area just do, you know dozens of miles wide, and they just kind of move with the wind, um, which is interesting. You know, the Lord brought a, a wind, and then the locust came, and then when He went to get rid of them, He brought another wind, and it blew them all out to sea. Um, so this is clearly the hand of God. All right, so. Um, he resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We could stay there all day. But then we've got this, uh, he's the God of unmatched power. In verse 21, uh, we've got the ninth plague of darkness. And, uh, you know, Egypt is well known for its worship of Ra, the sun god. And I did like the way that um, Bo brought out the spiritual uh, connection between you know, Israel is in physical darkness and Pharaoh's in spiritual darkness. The, peop the people of Egypt, uh, did I say Israel? Egypt is in darkness and spiritual darkness. And, um, but the people of Goshen had the light and how in John, darkness and light is constantly contrasted. We used to walk in darkness, but now the light of Christ. Uh, he, he transferred us from the kingdom of darkness, one of Paul's letters. I can't remember which one. Maybe Colossians. Yeah. Transferred us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his marvelous light. So there you go. Out of Egypt and slavery and sin into the light of God's presence in Goshen. And now James is... <laughs> Oh, look, an angel. <laughs> All right. Yes. Yeah, absolutely they did. Yeah, so I don't want to steal anybody's thunder, but... Um, it does say that um, when they left, when they left, there was a mixed multitude who left with them. So it was definitely not just the Hebrews. There were many Egyptians and probably people from other nationalities who became Israelites, which was the only way to be saved back then. You, you were saved by connecting with the people of Israel and worshiping Yahweh with them. Uh, you had to get circumcised to be part of the people, and you had to follow their dietary laws and their feast days, and you had to worship in the temple and bring your sacrifices. And it, it wasn't works that saved you. It was the faith that this is what Yahweh tells me to do. This is how I have a relationship with Yahweh. I connect my life with the people of Israel, and then he saves me, and I believe that, right? The same, Naaman did the same thing. Naaman, Haman, Naaman, the Syrian guy, right, with the leprosy, yeah. Um, he had leprosy, and, and Elijah, Elisha, one of them yeah. saved him. <laughs> All these names in the Bible, so similar. One of those guys saved him, right? And, um, and uh, the, you know what Naaman said? He was like, hey, can I give you all this money? And the prophet was like, no, I don't want your money, but you can, you, you just run along home now. And he goes, well, if you won't take my money, can you do me a favor? And Elijah, I think it was Elijah, was like, sure. And he goes, can I take two wheelbarrow full of, wheelbarrows full of dirt from your backyard? Can I take two truckloads of dirt from your backyard? 
And then when I go back home to Syria, I'm going to dump all that Israelite soil over my backyard, and I'm going to live in the land of Israel in Syria. If I can't live in Israel, I'm going to bring Israel back to Syria, and my property is going to be Israelite soil. Uh, because he understood, I'm saved by <clears throat> uniting uh, with the Israelite people. And he, he asked uh, Elijah, you know, can you pray to God that he'll forgive me because, you know, my master is a big time worshiper of false gods and he's really old. And so when he goes and bows down, I have to bow down to the God next to him and kind of hold his arm and then we stand up. So can you just ask God to forgive me whenever I bow down to these false gods because I'm not really worshiping them. I'm just doing my job. And he was like, yeah, sure, I'll pray that for you. So, um, yeah, you were, uh, think about Ruth, Ruth and Naomi. What does she say? Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. She was saved by abandoning Moab and uniting her life with the Israelite people. James. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and it, even in Exodus, uh, just a few chapters later, there are laws about how you treat sojourners in the land, you know, um, because you were a sojourner in Egypt is his point. Yes. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you essentially renounced your citizenship of your home country, and you became an Israelite. If you were a male, you were circumcised, and then you observed their dietary restrictions and their feast days and their sacrificial system, and you united with Israel. Now, in the tabernacle and in the temple later, there was in the, in the courtyard of the temple an area specifically designated for non-Jewish people. It's called the Court of the Gentiles. And then Inside the court of the Gentiles, there was another court called the court of the women that Jewish women could enter. And then there was the court of the men. And then the, the priests could go in, but only to the holy place. And the high priest could only go into the most holy space once a year. So, yeah, there was, depending on your nationality, this you could be part of my people. And this is this is your area. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so two things, two things about that. Number 1, the dis the question in Acts 15 was can a gentile be saved without giving up his gentileness? Can can a gentile be saved as a gentile or can he be saved like as in the Old Testament by renouncing everything gentile, being circumcised following the feast laws, following the dietary laws, following the sacrificial system, what does a Gentile have to do to become a Christian believer? That was the question in Acts. And the answer was, no, he no longer has to renounce. I mean, he has to renounce all his false gods, but he doesn't have to be circumcised. He doesn't have to join Israel in the sense that, you know, national Israel, he can be an ethnic Gentile, but, but part of the Israel of God. 
right? Um, the other thing that I want to say, and I just want to leave us with this, is um, uh, there is that passage, I think it's Colossians, where it says that Christ has broken down the dividing wall of hostility in his body. He, he destroyed, he broke down the wall of hostility. You know what that wall of hostility was? It was a real wall. It was a, a wall that was about waist height in the courtyard, and it was the wall that separates the court of the Gentiles from the courts of the Jews. That wall is called the dividing wall of hostility. So uh, in, in Israel today, if you were to go there, there's a little waist-high wall, and on it there are signs all over the place along this wall that say, if you are a Gentile and you cross this line, you will be killed immediately, and your blood is on your own hands. That is a dividing wall of hostility. If you're a Gentile, you can come this far and no farther. This is for the people of God. But Christ broke down that wall. In his death, he did not just die for the Jewish nation. He died for all who would share in the faith of Abraham. You know, so if you're a, a, an American, if you're from South America, if you're from Africa, if you're from Asia, if you're from Russia, whatever, it doesn't matter. Faith in Jesus Christ brings you all the way in, not just to the courtyard of the Jews. We go into the Holy of Holies, which veil was ripped from top to bottom, signifying now not just the high priest, but all believers are high priests in that we can enter into God's own presence whenever we want by prayer and by faith right? So we can come boldly into the throne room of God and ask for grace in our time of need, even though biologically we're not part of God's people. We are the people of God with Israel by the faith of Abraham. All right, let's go ahead. If you have further questions or want to discuss this, then let's discuss it after, but we are a little bit over. Father, thank you for this time, and thank you for each of the folks that were here and uh, stayed afterwards to discuss. I pray that you would bless us now as we go our separate ways and uh, help us to have a great um, community groups today and tomorrow and bring us back safely uh, next week. And we'll give you great thanks and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>